Okay, I tried to share the screen and it said host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, got it. Okay. Okay, there we go. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, bear with us. Uh, these presentations are usually done in person where we'd be able to tell whether you guys are falling asleep or laughing along with this. So we'll just uh, plow ahead tonight. Uh, it's good to see a lot of familiar faces in the digital audience there. Um, Mark Strother, who I was in school with. Christine Lambert, who I accidentally sent an email to a couple of days ago and scared the crap out of her about a project she'd never heard of never heard of, so. Um, and Linda Bentz is here with us tonight. She's the one who actually did the artifact analysis uh, on the um, on the Asian American artifacts that you'll see us talking about tonight. So um, might be able to bother her with some questions tonight. So, um, so uh, as you mentioned, um, uh, I'm an archeologist with PANDAS. I've done a lot of work in San Diego. The photo here on the right is actually from my first presentation for the SDCAS, uh, which was about a 19th century fishing boat uh, that we unearthed along the waterfront in Little Italy. Um, and for the project we're going to share with you tonight, I handled the historic research and the report writing. Next. And, uh, and Rachel handled the laboratory analysis, artifact research, and artifact photography for the project that we'll be sharing with you tonight. Next. So Panges is a woman-owned environmental consulting business. Uh, we mostly do GIS and archaeology, um, all kinds of other historic resources. Um, uh, we do historic structure evaluations and, and uh, things like that. And for this project, we're working with Helix Environmental. They're the ones that handle the monitoring for the project. And then we're also working in conjunction with the San Diego Chinese Historical Museum. That's where a lot of these artifacts are going to go once the project is complete and you'll be able to see some of them on display down there. So uh, first, let's show you where the project is located uh, using historic maps and photographs. So I love this thing. This is an 1876 bird's eye view illustration of San Diego. And it's facing the southwest. So you can see Coronado Island uh, in the middle there and Point Loma in the background on the right. And the two wharves that you can see um, are, at the, the one on the left is at the foot of Fifth Avenue, Fifth Street, and the one on the right is at G Street, so just south of where the Broadway Pier is now. And do you see all the trees? No, exactly, there weren't any trees. Trees just don't grow in San Diego. <laughs> Next. All right, so zooming in, a closer look. Uh, the uh, you can see our block near the wharf at the foot of Fifth Street, uh, where the convention center is today. Um, our block's highlighted in red there. And you can see that the illustration shows a house on the east side of the lot, as well as a small shack on the north. Uh, this is the only information that we have on those structures at all. Um, and part of why this lot was such a good location, we can see on the next slide. Uh, we're just a block and a half from the wharf, wharf here. This is a, a Sanborn map from 1887. Um, these were put, these Sanborn maps were put together by, uh, for fire insurance companies to help determine how much to charge for fire insurance. That makes them great for historians since they include stuff on like what material the buildings were made from, how many stories and things like that, as well as where the water pipes were um, and, and things like that that would matter most to, uh, to the fire insurance business. And they were released about every 15 or 20 years. And then they were updated by hand in between editions. So in our 1887 map here, our entire block was the Southern California Lumber Yard. And it was a great location for that because these huge rafts of logs would be floated down the coast to the wharf just a block and a half away. And from there, you can see the rail lines crossing into our block, uh, which would unload the logs into the lumber yard, which were then used for building houses and all kinds of other things around San Diego. Next. So this is what the gas lamp district looked at about the time of that last map. This shot is from 1886. And this is on Fifth Avenue, looking north from Market Street. 
So note that horse-drawn streetcar dead ahead. That's San Diego's first public transportation, and it opened the year this photo was taken in 1886. And the tall light pole in the distance, just to the right of the trolley car, uh, electric lights were installed in San Diego in 1881. A lot of people thought the light was creepy. It was kind of a blue-white glow um, coming down off the top of those masts, but it allowed stores to stay open later and, and, and business to continue. And there were six or eight of those all around downtown at the time. And here's that wharf, uh, just a block and a half from our project area, a little bit later, about 1890. And most people arriving to San Diego at this time came by ship. And this is where they would have landed. Uh, yeah, again, about a block and a half from the project. So by now, by, uh, now we've, we're looking at the 1906 map. So by this time, we've got several changes. The huge lumber yard is gone, and it's been replaced by smaller warehouses storing grain, lime and cement, hay and feed, coal. And on the north side of the block are, are, are rows of small residences built in 1897. They're anchored by a commercial structure on each end. On the top right, you can see is written in that square S-A-L for saloon. So let's talk about saloons and the Stingery District. Has anyone heard of the Stingery? Raise your digital hand. I can't, okay, I always see some hands there. Um, so I love this photo that Rachel added for the Stingery because it is exactly the type of people who would never be caught dead in the Stingery. They look very proper, clean cut, and respectable. The Stingery was where sailors went on shore leave. Booze, prostitution, more booze, gambling, and even more booze. So this next photo, this isn't our block, but it's just up the street. Uh, this is on 4th Avenue and F Street in 1913. And right in the center of the photo there is the Golden Lion Tavern. That later became the Hard Rock Cafe um, in the late 20th century. At the time of, I'm showing this because at the time of Prohibition, there were over 70 saloons and taverns in San Diego. And that, at that time, the population was only 70,000. So lots of bars. Uh, at least 55 of those 70 closed with prohibition. The rest of them, like the Golden Lion shown here, quit selling alcohol and focused on food instead. The saloon on our block was called the Legal Tender. Um, on, the, on the next block was the <laughs> Seven Buckets of Blood Saloon and the Old Tub of Blood. You get the idea. Uh, you can see in the ad here that ours was a classy establishment with fine wines, and live music. Uh, but they also mentioned furnished rooms. Let's talk about those for a second. Because uh, at least some of those were probably occupied by prostitutes. Other researchers used census records um, to map prostitution in, in the Stingery in the red light district. The map on the left is from 1900 and shows one prostitute on our block in the bottom left corner there between J and K Street. On the right is the 1910 map, and we're up to 12 prostitutes living on our block. Notice that just across the street to the north from where we are is the highest concentration, um, 45 in 1910. So nice ladies in the city wanted the stingery cleaned up, especially with the 19 and 1915 to 1916 Expo, the World's Fair coming. So the city put Walter Bellin, the health inspector, in charge. Um, he first did a survey and wrote up his findings. This is his map of the neighborhood. Our block is in the top middle, just below K Street there. Um, north is to the bottom of this map. So number 11 on this map is our saloon, the, uh, the legal tender, and number 30 are the little residences right next to it. So Bellin wrote that the dives were called stables because they resembled stalls, built in a long row facing a compound, one opening leading to each room from the outside and a door that gave seclusion. A wash bowl and pitcher served as plumbing, a bed and a chair or two. Water was carried from a lone faucet that stood outside. 
So that was what Bellin wrote about these, uh, about these stables. Just below our block, uh, between I and J, you can see these tiny little residences, and those were the stables. Those were the prostitution cribs. So we can tell that our, our block, uh, number 11 and number 30 above there, looked a little bit different. They weren't quite as small as those. The other interesting thing about uh, our block that's different is that most of those cribs were accessed from inside the saloon. You had to go into the saloon and the saloon operated as a gatekeeper before you could access the, the cribs in the back. Um, that made sure that the tavern owners could charge um, and collect the money and that a bouncer was around to stop any trouble. Our block's a little different. Our doors open from all the residences in number 30 there on the map, open straight onto J Street. So slightly different setup. So while we know from the historic records that there were prostitutes living on our block, it was a different kind of setup than most of the cribs in the, uh, the stingery at the time. Next. So that's the historic research that was done ahead of the project. Uh, we would expect to find artifacts related to saloons, like liquor bottles, and to the prostitutes who lived in the small residences next door, like perfume, that kind of thing, along with the artifacts from young single men who worked at the saloon. Until recently, the property was occupied by a large warehouse, uh, which you can see in the photograph on the left, it's outlined in red, and that was entirely occupied by the Cost Plus World Market Store. So the warehouse was torn down and heavy equipment began excavating the north half of the block to about five or six feet deep. Since we expected to find historic artifacts, archeological monitors working for Helix were on site during excavation and they hopped into action whenever anything turned up in the dirt. Uh, in the photo on the right, you can see them collecting artifacts which will be trans transported back to the lab for analysis. Not every artifact was brought back to the lab. The soil was pretty contaminated, and so they really just collected a sample uh, that would hopefully tell us more about the former occupants of the block, uh, including a total of 349 artifacts that were collected. So what all did they recover? And I'll pass this on to Rachel now. So as Doug mentioned, there was 349 artifacts, so, but we only have 30 minutes. So this slide kind of serves as an honorable mention slide. Um, you can see we have bones that they would use for, that they showed they were eating food, as well as shells for seafood. Uh, there's that little rat poison bottle in the center that I think is pretty cool. It was like, I don't know, an inch and a half tall. It was pretty small. And then also the veterinary food um, fragments, and then also an atomizer, and then some other household goods, like a figurine and that little makeup jar there on the bottom row still had some leftover pigment in it. Um, of course, one of the main things recovered were alcohol bottles because of the saloon. Um, so what can we tell from these bottles? Well, based on these things such as the seams, the maker's marks and the bubbles in the glass, we can tell a lot of information. Um, for example, these two beer bottles, both of the seams stopped before the finish. Um, so we could tell that they were created pre-automatic bottling machine, which dates them around 1906. On the left is a, a bottle that had a B Co stamped into it and then also an S7. So that we dated that one from the AB Co company, American Bottling Company, uh, 1907. And then on the right, we have one from Reed and Company, and that's from Ohio, the Ohio plant. Um, between 1881 and 1904. Uh, on this slide is some more examples of different kinds of alcohol bottles we collected. There was whiskey, champagne, all different kinds. So they weren't just drinking beer. Uh, <laughs> but the same goes for ceramics. We used kind of a similar way of identifying the year. These are ceramic beer bottles. Uh, you can't really see in the picture but there's a little stamp on the bottom of that one on the left-hand side. And that stamp read H. Kennedy, Burrowfield, 5, Pottery, Glasgow. So from that, we pulled the information that it was by, most likely created by the Henry Kennedy, who established the Burrowfield Potteries in Glasgow, Scotland in 1886. Um, and then he passed it on to his sons in 1923. 
This particular bottle, we believe, dates between 1880 and 1890. And it's just interesting to think that these bottles made it from Scotland to San Diego in that time period. And then also by the two-tone coloring, we can tell that helped us there with the dates based on the popularity of that style. Uh, next, we have the water bottles or the soda water. Um, these bottles were created with thicker glass than normal bottles uh, due to the carbonation. And a lot of these times, these bottles are typically owned by bottling companies and then were collected after use and resold to be refilled. This first bottle is the Crystal Bottling Company. Um, what's special about it is it has this R in the image. You can kind of see it a little bit. It curls at the end. That's called the San Francisco R. So we traced it all the way back to a particular style. Uh, it was likely manufactured between 1885 and 1887 in San Francisco by the Pacific Glassworks Company. This next bottle is a Silvergate Soda Works um, fragment and embossed on the side, you can see it says San Diego uh, uh, Silvergate Soda Works and it was by Emil and Albert Schnepp, the Schnepp brothers, and they were in business from 1907 to 1918. So this one's pretty cool because it's San Diego local uh, it's the San Diego Soda Works bottle. And then on the right, you can see an image of their shop, which was located on Logan Avenue and near, near our site. Um, and they were in business from 1887 to 1962. And the main proprietors were Gustav H. Giddick, who operated a series of plants on Logan Avenue in the 1900s. <laughs> Um, Monarch Soda Works, we had a little trouble with this one to locate because they were only in business from 1913 to 1915. They dabbled in the soda creating company. Um, it was originally created by Abraham Hades, who was a tailor originally, and then him and his son Maurice decided to dip their toes into Soda Works. Uh, but only for two years, and then after which they moved on to North Park and started a trucking company, a truck, a truck line. This bottle here is a round bottom, round bottom bottle, tongue twister, <laughs> and they were also known as a ballast bottle because they were shipped along ships um, as a ballast. Uh, not on this particular artifact that we covered, but on another one, there was a large T embossed on it from uh, Belf Belfast, Ireland. So they also traveled a long distance to make it here to San Diego. And they were popular in the 20th century. The round bottom was used to encourage people to lay them on their sides so that way the cork wouldn't dry out. Okay, so in addition to alcohol bottles, and soda bottles, there's also other consumer bottles. Um, this is one of my favorite bottles. It's the Welch's grape juice bottle. It's a tiny four ounce bottle. Um, Welch's was founded by Thomas Welch in 1869. And it was originally used as a alternative to altar wine at churches. So it's non-alcoholic. Uh, it became very popular after the 1893 World's Fair, and then even more so in 1910s during the temperance movement. Uh, this particular bottle was likely manufactured between 1893 and 1906. And then there's a little historic ad there on the right-hand side. Next, we have chili and chili powder. Um, Gabbard's chili is actually still sold in stores today. So you could go find some out there. It was originally created in Texas in, 19, in 1896. Um, and then they began advertising and becoming more popular in 1908. And then for this bottle, we dated it between 1896 and 1906. Uh, here we have some cough syrup, which in the ad you can see is very popular with the children. 
um, which is, you know, I guess back then it would be probably the children. It was full of morphine and alcohol and it claimed it could cure tuberculosis, whipping cough and influenza. So, you know, it's a cure-all, it's some morphine and alcohol, can't go wrong. And the kids love it. Yep. <laughs> uh, next we have Burnett's Coca-Cane hair. Um, they had, cocaine was all the rage during this time period, um, but this product doesn't contain cocaine, so that's how it was able to continue being produced after the 1906 FDA sweep, which, um, you know, was like, they no longer allowed cocaine in products. It mainly contained coconut oil, and that's where the coca comes from. Uh, and then this particular bottle fragment was probably from the 1980s to, or 1890s, sorry, to the early 1900s. <laughs> and I like the ad and like the price. So you can see the price there was 50 cents and one dollar per bottle. Uh, this here is the, our, what we recovered on the left hand side of the screen is a tiny fragment of the Ferris and Ferris bottle. So then above, the above image is pulled from the internet of what a full bottle would look like. So there's a lot about this Ferris bottle here. Uh, if you can see in the background, there's the Ferris and Ferris prescription ad. And then in the foreground is Buffalo Bill and his wife that came to San Diego for a parade that day. And so they just happened to get photographed right in front of the Ferris and Ferris drugstore. And then inside the store, we can see there's a rare image of the inner store, and it says, the Ferris store is equipped to give service. And as you can tell by the image, they can give you any service. They got some animal skins that you can purchase, a crane, a stuffed crane on the right-hand side, and then it's a pharmacy. So they, you know, just like your everyday CVS, it was everything you could think of. And this pharmacy was actually, run by Gregory Peck's father. Uh, it was established in 1888 and it was located adjacent to our site on 5th and J Street and it later moved to 5th and Market. It was one of the first 24-hour pharmacies so it was open both day and night and there would be a bell you can pull and it would call the pharmacist down and it served as both a post office and check cashing. And you know, the famous actor Gregory Peck, he was one of the delivery boys. So if you wanted, you know, your farm your pharmaceuticals delivered to you, you could have got a famous person delivered to you. <laughs> uh, this bottle here is the Palmer perfume bottle. It's kind of hard to see an image, but you can see the slight embossing of Palmer. It's easier to see in the images on the right hand side of the screen where they have it in the paper labels. It was a popular perfume at the time that was established by Salome Palmer in Cincinnati, Ohio, and then later moved to New York as it grew in popularity. He passed down the company to his son in 1892, and then it closed in 1947. So it did have a long run, um, but closing in the 40s. And this is the Cream Simon bottle. It was it's theorized that it might have been used by a prostitutes on our block. Um, it's a skincare cream and it was very popular. Everyone advertised it. The, a famous opera artist was one of the first to give it a good thumbs up from saying she loved it, it made her skin look beautiful. Um, and it was sold global, globally. So it was a French brand, but it was sold all over the 20th century. Cool. <laughs> All right, but wait, there's more. Um, what about the fancy ladies and the health inspectors report and the World's Fair? Uh, so in 1912, the police raided the stingery, arrested all the prostitutes, and tore down all of the stables. Uh, originally, the police were really against busting up the stingery district because they had it pretty well contained. They knew what was going on where. Um, and they were worried that if they shut it all down, it would just disperse across the city. 
And that's exactly what happened. They busted all the prostitutes. They gave them the option of reforming or taking the next train out of town. I think only one of the 127 prostitutes that they arrested decided to reform. The rest all bought train tickets. It turns out, though, that they bought round trip tickets to L.A. and they were back the next day. And sure enough, they dispersed throughout town. So uh, it didn't really have the effect uh, that the that the fancy ladies were after in, in shutting down all the bikes. Um, so what happened to our block? Um, our block didn't get torn down like a lot of the stables did. Instead, it was absorbed by Chinatown, which was centered just a, bl a block northwest of ours. We don't have time to get deep into Chinatown tonight, uh, but Linda Benz, who's in the audience here, and myself will be giving another lecture in August at the Chinese Historical Museum that will focus more on the Asian artifacts and the Chinatown connection here. Uh, so stay tuned to that. But tonight, we'll cover the basics. So here's what we got. In our 1921 map, it looks pretty similar to the 1906 map we saw earlier, except now it shows a store at each end of the block on the top right and the top left, no saloon. And now each row of residences, it might be hard to read on the screen here, but uh, on each row of residences, it's labeled Chinese. There might have been a couple of Chinese families on the block before the 1912 Stingery sweep, but after that sweep, it really became entirely Chinese. So this is a picture of our block taken in 1925. This is the northwestern corner. The sign reads, Wo On Chinese Merchandise, Wo On and Company Chinese Merchandise. Behind that sign, if you can make it out in this photo, you can still see part of the sign from the legal tender bar before that. So that's the corner this was. And here is the northwest corner of the block the other view, uh, with the other store that anchors the, uh, the northwest end. And it looks like they might have had a garden, maybe some chickens. In the background, you can see the small warehouses made of wood on the right, and then the large brick one in the background on the next block over. And these were a steel. We, we've, we tracked these down at the History Center in Balboa Park. Um, it's a real rarity to be able to actually find old historic photos of your project. That's really not very common. So we scored on this, that's good stuff. Okay, next. So uh, at least half of our block was leased by A Quinn, who was the unofficial mayor of Chinatown. And he was a merchant who straddled the Chinese and the Anglo communities. And he sublet the residences to Chinese families. So here's a photo of uh, Quinn. He's on the right with the white hair um, and his family in 1899. And is that all tw 12 children we count? Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, all 12. So <laughs> to learn more about uh, Quinn, uh, check out the Chinese Historical Museum, which is uh, across the street from our project area. Online for now, but definitely worth a visit down there when they reopen. They do free walking tours of San Diego's Chinatown every month. You can just go join those uh, and go on a tour and they'll point out where all of the, chi the, the uh, Chinatown landmarks are and stuff like that. Um, really good museum. So uh, as you might have guessed, we also collected a lot of Asian artifacts uh, during the excavation. So I'm gonna bounce this back to Rachel so she can tell you a little bit about those. So as we saw on the Ah Quinn slide, it said that he was a purveyor of both Japanese and Chinese goods. So although we cover, uh, although we recovered <laughs> some Japanese goods, um, it might not have been correlated to having Japanese people in the neighborhood. Uh, for example, this is a sake bottle that was recovered. Um, it's a Japanese sake decanter or tokori. Um, and the top motif, the little gourds there, was identified as a haiton or a bottle gourd vine. And the bottom motif, those little squares, are known as a chidori, which literally means thousands of birds. And I thought it was really cute. And then we also recovered a toothbrush. So what we found on our site was that image on the left, just that tiny little nub. Um, but luckily, Linda had seen it before, and she's like, oh, yes, that's a toothbrush. And so she gave us this image from the LA recovery of the similar product. Um, these toothbrushes were created out of bone, and when the bristles wore down, they could easily be replaced through those little holes at the top. Um, 
we could tell that this was more of a Chinese toothbrush based on the fact that the European toothbrushes tended to be a bit longer. These little bottles here are herbal medicine. Uh, they look like they could hold about, you know, two drops of liquid, not very much at all. Uh, they're often confused to be opium bottles. The bottle on the right hand side of the screen is probably an eye medicine bottle. Um, it has markings on the bottom. It's kind of difficult to see in the image, uh, but we had some students come from the Chinese Historical Museum and they looked at the bottle and they were able to tell us what the symbol. So that was really interesting to have that experience with them. And um, it means, I'm probably gonna mispronounce it, so forgive me here, Gong. Um, for the Gongdong province in China and Xing, which is born. So it might mean that was manufactured in that province of China. Uh, here we have the brown glazed utilitarian style of fragments. Um, we have one soy sauce jar and two liquor jar fragments. Um, these kind of bottles Although they were known for holding soy sauce or liquor, they also held other things. Um, the liquor tended to be distilled to be 100 proof and was consumed for medical properties as well as cooking and drinking. And then the soy sauce could have also held liquids such as um, liquor, black vinegar, and peanut oil. Are they part of the Chinese community? is having community dishes and community meals. We see something similar to this nowadays at Chinese restaurants. Um, and one of those things that is shared are the rice bowls. So we recovered these winter green rice bowls. Um, and on the bottom, you can see they have those markings. These markings uh, were often a, tied together to a different kiln um, and to each reign of the government. So these are likely the Zing Zen Hen kilns. Sorry, I'm not very, my Mandarin or Chinese isn't too great, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and, but oftentimes these kind of markings could have been abstract, so they don't really mean something. Sometimes they could mean that there's certain government kilns. These uh, particular artifacts are from the Four Seasons. Uh, they refer to the different flowers that are come across at the Four Seasons. They're manufactured in the same area as the previous ones. I'm not gonna try and say the name again, just so I don't mess it up too much. Um, so this design feature was a polychrome painted flowers to represent uh, different values in different seasons. So the peonies can symbolize something like riches and honor and good fortune or be springtime. And the lotus was for spiritual purity or summer. So the different flowers each had different meanings to them. And then this last one is the rose medallion teacup. Um, its motif was very in style from 1855 to the 20th century. And then like the shells and bones, we also recovered some metal artifacts that are difficult to date due to rusting, but it was most likely Chinese. Um, they did have a laundry mat, so that image on the left is uh, iron, and then the image on the top right is the horseshoe. Um, as we saw in the Sanborn maps, there was a corral that was uh, established during that time period, and then the bottom right is just a metal bowl. Is also metal. <laughs> cool. Uh, thank you, Rachel. So moving forward, what happened? Uh, when did the Chinese families leave? So next. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. So here we have the 1946 Sanborn, which was the next one published. Uh, so in 1925, shortly after those photos of our block were taken, all of the structures on the north half of the block were torn down and a single large warehouse was put up in their place along with an adjacent parking lot. The 1946 Sanborn map here shows that warehouse uh, and it is labeled Beer Warehouse and Montgomery Ward Company. The, uh, the main Monkey Ward store was a few blocks away on Broadway. Next. 
So it's interesting to see how much this part of San Diego changed in a relatively short period of time. This shot here is from eight, oh, go back please. Sorry. That's right. So this, uh, this shot here is from 1887. So not long before our residences were built. It shows Fifth Avenue looking north from Market. You've got dirt roads, telegraph wires, horse-drawn carriages. It looks like an old West Town, right? So keep an eye on that brick building on the left. And now we'll look at the next photo. This is the, it, the same block in 1924, the year before they tore down all of our residences. Same brick building on the left, but it's barely visible. We've got 10 story buildings. There's pavement everywhere. Not a horse in sight. Everything's motorized. Well, except for the bicycle in the intersection. Uh, so that's a lot of change in, in a short period of time. Next photo. And now this has replaced the warehouse on our block. After nearly 100 years, it's a residential block again, which is pretty cool. And so what did we learn? The most important thing is that the research and the artifacts matched. So based on the historic research, we expect to find artifacts from two different occupation periods. The earlier 1897 to 1912 European American occupation, which was uh, mostly um, young single men working for the tavern and young single women as prostitutes. And the later occupation, 1912 to 1925, was a Chinese American occupation and it was primarily families and merchants. And that's what we found, which is super exciting for archeologists. Uh, and it makes up for some of our huge student loans that we have. Um, so that's what we have for you guys tonight. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, and uh, however we'd like to handle questions, um, maybe we could even have Linda unmute herself out there in case we get any that are specific to uh, the, uh, the Asian artifacts, so. Cool, thank you. Bravo, bravo. Um, thank you, Rachel and Doug. We already have a couple questions coming into the chat from Marilyn asking, did the railroad have anything to do with Chinese being in San Diego? If not, was there a primary reason? I'll take part of this and then I might kick it over to, uh, uh, to Linda, but the, the short answer is no, it didn't have to do with the railroad down here. Um, the, uh, that was mainly in Northern California. Uh, the rail lines we had here, we had in the 1880s, we had a line going up towards LA, um, but we didn't actually have our main rail construction here until the San Diego and Arizona in 1917. And so it was already a much different world by then. Uh, and that was after the Chinese Exclusion Acts and a whole bunch of other stuff. So, Linda, do you want to pop in on why they were here since it wasn't the railroad? Sure. So Thanks. the um, earliest Chinese that came to San Diego were in the fishing industry. And uh, they started out having uh, fishing camps out at Dallas Point. And then when New Newtown was built, they moved, they moved into town. But it was a very lucrative industry. They were building Chinese junks in San Diego. And so that's why they originally came there and then they um, expanded. And then you have your Chinatown, which has your merchants and um, there's families there. There's all kinds, of, all kinds of industry there. So I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Okay, what else you got? Uh, from Christine, she said, what are the standard protocols for dealing with the contaminated soils? mentioned recovering yeah. under artifacts and how many do you estimate were not recovered due to some type of contamination? We might let Mary pop in here. Um, Rachel and I weren't involved in the actual recovery of the artifacts. Uh, that was handled by Helix. So we didn't show up until after everything had already been collected. Um, but uh, I've had a similar, um, uh, on another project that I'm working on with Mary right now in Little Italy, we had a, a similar issue. Um, of contaminated soil. So let me talk about that one a little bit. We had a gas station that was built on there later. So there was all kinds of uh, fuel storage tanks. And then we had a paint manufacturing company that was built there. So we had all kinds of lead paint in the soil. Um, 
But just the fact that our artifacts are in the soil because they're old, they're made of lead, they're made of glass, there's all kinds of seepage that's actually caused by the material that we're looking for. Um, typically what we have on a project where we know that we've got some, uh, some old nasty soil like that, we're gonna have um, specialists come out who test the soil. And so us archeologists, we'll do anything from wear special protective equipment like gloves all the way up to full hazmat suits. Um, but we will rely on, on the soil testers to let us know how hazardous that is and how much we're able to be exposed to that. Um, but uh, we're typically touching the soil as little as possible, um, rinsing off our hands, rinsing off the artifacts and all that before that stuff even gets brought to the lab to look at any closer. So um, yeah, do you wanna talk about that at all, Rachel? You had the fun job of cleaning some of this stuff, right? Oh yeah. Project? yeah. Cleaning it, you know, it, sometimes it's a little smelly if it was from a movie. Um, <laughs> but besides that, it was just pretty, you know, for the ones that we could spray with water, we sprayed with water and made sure we got a toothbrush and cleaned them real nice so we can make sure to see all the maker's marks. Um, and with the dry brush, we just did the same, but without the water. Yeah, so uh, at least as far as the other project we're working on, there were a lot of artifacts we did not collect because uh, it was just, it was deemed too contaminated. And uh, so we, we cherry pick basically, and we collect stuff that we know is gonna teach us about the people that were occupying that, that area earlier. And the rest, we just have to give up. It's not worth our health, so. Marilyn also asked if the soil testers are part of our part of your contract or if they're separate and they're separate. Yeah, and that's really handled on a case by case basis. Uh, you know, it's it's not always necessary. It's it's something that that uh, you know, with that little Italy project, we didn't really have an idea of of how contaminated that area would be until I had completed some of that historic research and found out, oh, geez look at the you know the 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 industry that was on this block before we should be careful going forward so um so yeah that's all really part of the the background research that goes into a project and not just for archaeology but all of the environmental sciences and so we try to know what we're getting into um so it it it's pretty typical on urban archaeology projects so pretty much anything i do in the old downtown area we're 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 considering that because it's pretty likely. Okay, Jim wants to know what the status of the collection is. So we were just wrapping this up when COVID hit. So there are a couple of parts that we haven't quite been able to finish. Um, the, the, uh, the European American artifacts are going to be curated at the San Diego Archaeological Center in Escondido. They are currently shut down because of COVID. So uh, these, uh, the, the artifacts are boxed up, they're ready to go, but they are still at the PANDAS lab right now, uh, waiting for that facility to reopen. The, uh, the, the Asian artifacts are going to be curated with the Chinese Historical Museum of San Diego. Same story there, they're shut down right now. So a lot of this stuff is just in a holding pattern. All the reports have been written, the, art, the analysis is complete, everything is boxed up and ready to go to its curation facilities, but really we're just waiting for things to settle down a bit and for everybody to reopen. So. Mark wants to know what the, the depth, depth range was for your artifact recovery and how disturbed was it and were, they, were the artifacts protected at all by any fill or anything like that? It was a complete mess. Uh, they, the, uh, the depth was five or six feet, so that wasn't too deep. There was no parking garage going in under these condos or anything like that. Um, but what we've been able to put together was that when, when those structures were torn down in 1925, before the new warehouse was built, there was a whole bunch of disturbance. That stuff was scattered all over the place. Most of our collection came from the east side on the north half of the block, so pretty close to where the saloon was marked on the map. Um, but we had stuff scattered. There really weren't any concentrated deposits, you know, that were um, identifiable as such. So uh, it was just really disturbed and spread out. Another reason why it wasn't as important to, um, to really get into that contaminated soil much, right? 
I mean, we were able to assess the risk and decide that, you know what, there's a high risk of, you know, we're, we're in this really contaminated soil, but there's not a whole lot of information pertaining to the, the original location of these artifacts here, unfortunately, so. It was nice to work with lots of whole bottles, though, and not a bunch of tiny little fragments. So I'm thankful that they didn't collect all those teeny little broken pieces of glass. <laughs> Because awesome. we did on the we did on the other project, yeah. The, yeah. Our little Italy project, we recovered about ten times as many artifacts as this, but it's mostly a bunch of small little things. So yeah, what was really amazing, Mark, too, is that you know, even with that level of disturbance, how many intact bottles we got. You know, that's pretty cool. So. Shannon wants to know: Are there any structural remains or any specific features at the site? None. Again, we were really just handling the artifact analysis, but um, all the all the field reports that I looked at from the monitoring, no structural remains, no foundations, nothing like that. Uh, it's possible there was something down below the five or six feet, um, but they covered pretty much every corner of that northern half of that block as well. So my guess is all of that was blown out um, in 1925 for uh, when they when they did the excavation for the warehouse. So. I guess there's a side question from Marilyn about how she can access the report or a summary for the Little Italy project. So Little Italy is not done yet. Um, uh, if you reach out to me directly, uh, I'd be glad to talk with you about that. We can stay in touch. Um, um, that's the next project. We had to finish this first. So um, Mary's in the audience here. I know she'll be really happy to uh, to have that one done. <laughs> um, we got caught that, that we were really just diving into that when COVID hit. So that one got delayed. But um, uh, but that's the project that Rachel and I are working on now. And uh, so that's going to be another couple of months out. Uh, we'd be glad to come back here and uh, and share that with you guys again, uh, probably end of the year or early next year. It's probably going to be a little while. So, but for now, actually, for a little teaser, all the all the bottles that you can see on the shelf behind me, those are all from Little Italy. Those are from the Broadstone Project, which is just a block or two from where Rachel and I are working now. So, <laughs> um, same time frames, late 1800s to early 1900s, mostly. That was my next question. Thank you, Doug. Um, <laughs> Shannon wanted to know if there are other projects in the vicinity that had similar results and similar artifacts that were recovered. If you know offhand. Yeah, so we, the, the, the record search that we have, uh, it really only covers the next block out. Um, there, there's a ton of archaeology down there. Um, the, the Chinese Historical Museum has a lot from the area. Um, they, they specifically state that they're interested in those collections if anyone else is working in those areas. Um, the biggest thing down in that area where you've got the most information on really is the ballpark. Um, you know, the, there were so many projects that were spun off of and so many different CRM firms, archaeology firms that they got to do work on, on that material. Um, uh, so, but there, I'm trying to think of the others. ASM did um, uh, did one of the stable areas just to the east. Um, there, the Levi store. Um, yeah, so there are several down there. Um, your best bet, if you want to, if you want to learn about that, is head to the San Diego Archaeological Center up in Escondido. They have all of those artifact collections and all of those reports. If you're an archaeologist or a historian, you can access those collections. If you're not, you can ask the people who work there about them and they will tell you all you want to know. Specifically for the Asian American stuff, check out the CHM or there are a couple of books, Linda might be able to pipe up here, um, that will tell you more about Chinatown. So. Yes, hello. Uh, yes, Murray Lee, who used to be the curator at the uh, Chinese Historical Museum, wrote a beautiful book about the uh, about the Chinese community there. Um, if you go to the History Center, there are several journals that have been written about the Chinese, but Murray Lee's book is, it's the seminal work. Thank you. Hey, can I pipe up for a minute, Doug? This is Mary. Yes, absolutely. Um, 
Uh, Athenus and Walter Enterprises also did um, an excavation about a block away from here that was uh, um, a Chinese um, site as well. And that report is at um, the Archaeological Center. It's also at SCIC and it's at the historic, the Chinese um, Historical Museum. Um, I believe that it's called On Gold Mountain. I don't remember, but yep. um, Steve and Susan did a, a really good job on that one. Excellent. Thank you. I see one more question. There is asking if there's any evidence of fires, if there had been, if, if any of the area you were working in had been affected by fire, if you know. No, uh, from, from reading the monitoring reports, we didn't have any of that. that. That's pretty common. Usually we'll find signs of fire, even if there wasn't, you know, like a structure fire. I mean, because um, prior to city, city garbage collection, the way that most people would dispose of the trash was they would, well, either they would head into their backyard and throw it right over their fence under someone else's yard, especially if it was city government property. Um, but otherwise, they'd dig a hole in their backyard, shove in the week's trash, light it on fire to burn it down and then shove a scoop of dirt over it, tamp it down, and do the same next week over and over again. So we often find these historic trash deposits that are just layers of ash and burnt artifacts. And, and it doesn't mean that a house burned down, it just means that that's how they dispose of the trash. So in this case though, I, Linda, or, uh, Rachel, maybe you can correct me, but I don't remember that we had very many burnt artifacts at all. Um, Some of the bone had like a little bit of fire damage, probably from cooking it though. Yeah, and so that could be a, a, an issue with selective collection. Uh, but, uh, but as I mentioned, we didn't find any features or any kind of you know, intact deposits like that. So uh, nothing like that for this project. And thanks, Myra. <laughs> she knows. Um, are there any other questions? Last call for questions. I'm watching the chat. Type fast. <laughs> well, if not, then um, I just want to wrap up by saying thanks again to Doug and Rachel. Thank yes, you very Andrew, much for joining us tonight. Um, go ahead, Andrew. Hey, it's Andrew Munson here. I don't have a question. I just wanted to say hello. And I miss all you guys at Pandas, and I hope you're doing good. Thank you. Good to see you. You too. Good job. So um, we'll go ahead and wrap it up and we'll stay, stay tuned for next month's lecture and keep an eye on the website and your email. And thanks a lot for coming, everybody. See you next time. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.